Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Edwards. I'm a local orthopedic surgeon here in Southwest Michigan and medical director of surgical services at Spectrum Health Lakeland. Thank you for joining me today. While we're waiting for some people to log on, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I've been at Lakeland for over 28 years and I grew up in New York, went to college in Massachusetts and medical school in Syracuse. And after graduating from medical school, I did my internship at Portsmouth Naval Hospital and residency at the National Naval Medical Center at Bethesda, Maryland. I had the privilege of serving in the Navy for nine years, and in that time, uh, had many adventures in the Navy that perhaps we can talk about. After leaving the Navy, I came to Lakeland, had been in practice here for 28 years, and have loved every opportunity that I've had at Lakeland. Now to get started, Let's watch a brief video about today's topic. Today we're gonna to talk about total hip replacement and today I hope we can talk about new techniques and best practices um, in the way of disclosures. I'm the medical director of surgical services at Lakeland. I serve on several board committees at Lakeland. I'm also on the board for the Berry and Health Department. But most importantly, I have no industry financial relationships that could cause a conflict in our discussion today. So arthritis is a big problem in the United States with an escalating number of fellow Americans developing arthritis, over 50 million. And if we look at the growth of arthritis over the years, you can see in 1995 an estimate of about 40 million Americans with arthritis and now almost 60 million Americans with uh, arthritis. And this has big implications when it comes to Medicare expenditures because total hip and total knee replacement comprise the largest procedural expense in the Medicare budget. And I think we should all be aware that the future environment is gonna be one of cost containment and quality improvement, and that's gonna make proper patient selection ex essential and we're going to talk about why the things that we do at Lakeland are all designed to maximize quality in your total hip replacement. So if we look at the number of total joints done in the United States, it's an enormous number. As you can see, total knee represents the highest number, followed by total hips, total shoulder, and then revision surgery. And we can see from this slide that there's been a pretty substantial increase in the numbers of total knees and total hips that are being done in the United States. So we're gonna begin our discussion with the discussion of what exactly is hip arthritis. So on the left, we see a normal x-ray of the hip. Basically, a hip is a ball that fits in a socket. And when we're trying to determine whether somebody has arthritis or not, it really comes down to the distance between the ball and the socket. On the left-hand slide, we can see that there's abundant distance between the ball and the socket. On the right-hand slide, you can see that there's no distance between the ball and the socket, and that's because all the cartilage has worn away. And when we define arthritis, arthritis is a loss of cartilage over bone, so bones rub on bone. It's that simple. Now, there are lots of causes of hip pain. We just talked about osteoarthritis, and that's wear and tear, where the cartilage just wears off the bearing surfaces. Now, some people get inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis, and basically, this is a disease that attacks cartilage, and that's what wears the cartilage away, causing hip pain. You can have post-traumatic arthritis, Many people have had hip dislocations or hip fractures or hip injuries, and that can cause eventual hip arthritis. You can develop a condition called avascular necrosis, which is the result of a lack of blood supply to the ball, and that can cause hip pain. And there are a lot of childhood hip diseases that can cause eventual hip pain, such as hip dysplasia. Now, when we meet a patient that has hip arthritis, we talk about the various treatment options. And here, let's reflect on some of the conservative options. So diet and exercise. Many people that come to our office are a bit overweight, and they often consider themselves at fault for developing their arthritis. And I wanna make it clear, 
Weight does not cause arthritis. Weight can make arthritis more symptomatic, and so it makes common sense that if you lose a little bit of weight, you may be less symptomatic from your arthritis. Medications can help, and with this, we typically are talking about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and that would include things you're familiar with, Aleve, Advil, Meloxicam, Mobic, Diclofenac, medicines like that. Physical therapy can be very helpful in hip arthritis, particularly with increasing your range of motion and improving your walking tolerance. Some patients will benefit from hip arthroscopy when they're quite young because things can be cleaned up in the joint of a younger patient and basically put off hip replacement surgery. Injections are occasionally used in hip arthritis, but we really never use hip injections to treat hip arthritis. We used hip injections for diagnosis when we're having difficulty trying to determine whether or not your hip pain is caused by your back or if it's caused by your hip. But the results of injections into the hip as a treatment modality are generally disappointing. One thing that we talk to patients about is activity modification when they have hip arthritis. Because if you can reduce some of the very vigorous activity, you may be less symptomatic. But let's face it, most people don't want to reduce their activities. They want to get rid of their pain. And if we're unsuccessful treating you conservatively, that's when we talk about hip replacement surgery. So now we're gonna move on and we're actually gonna talk very specifically about what is hip replacement surgery? How do we do hip replacement surgery? Who's a candidate for hip replacement surgery? You know, basically I think there are several criteria that you have to meet to become a candidate for hip replacement surgery. Well, number one, you have to have x-rays that show you have arthritis. Number two, you have to have at least tried some non-operative treatment as we discussed anti-inflammatories, activity modification, maybe some physical therapy. You have to have pain that affects the quality of your life. We don't operate on x-rays, we operate on people. So if you have terrible looking x-rays but you feel good, you don't need an operation. And we have to have optimized medical status. And that means we have to improve your medical status so that your risk of having problems post-operatively or having an infection is really minimized. So what actually happens when we do a hip replacement? Well, basically what we do is we remove the ball, which is known as your femoral head, and we replace it with a metal stem that goes into the thigh bone, and then on top of that stem, we put either a metal or a ceramic ball. We put a metal socket into your socket, and inside that socket is a plastic liner and then we put the ball in the plastic socket. So basically we have a ball in a plastic socket in a very low friction environment. So the pain goes away because you don't have bone rubbing on bone and the range of motion is increased in that construct. So what do we do? Well first we remove the femoral head. So after your incision we use a saw as you can see on the right and we basically make a cut in an area that we call the femoral neck, which is the bridge of bone that's in between the ball and the shaft of your femur or your thigh bone. Once we've removed the ball, then we can see the socket of your hip. And we wanna make your socket very regular. So we do what we call reaming of the acetabulum. And we have this device that's called a reaming tool but really it looks like a cheese grater. And we basically use this to fashion the socket into a perfect alignment. Then we insert the acetabular or the socket component. And you can see the cartoon on the left. And, but on the right, this is a real picture of us putting an acetabular component in a socket. Then we prepare the femoral canal or the thigh bone. Now, the thigh bone is hollow. And basically what we do is we have various brooches that we utilize to prepare the femur. And we use small ones to start and we basically build up until we have one that fits your canal. 
and then we insert that stem, the femoral stem, and on top of that stem goes the ball, and you can see the stem is inserted in slide A, and the ball has been put on top of the stem in slide B. So the femoral head is attached, as you can see here, and this is what a total hip looks like after we put the ball into the socket. And that's an x-ray. So on the left, you can see what a normal hip looks like. On the right, you can see what a replaced hip looks like. So what are some of the innovations in total hip replacement that are particularly germane to Lakeland? Well, number one, we're very fortunate to use computer navigation. And as you will see, this allows us to put great precision when we place your hip components. The second is the advent of the direct anterior hip approach, which has gained a lot of popularity, and we're going to talk about that. And the third is your surgeons at Lakeland participate in a quality program in the state of Michigan that every patient in our area should be aware of. So first of all, on to computer-assisted surgery. Basically, when we do computer-assisted surgery, we're using components that allow us to very precisely place your hip components in the best possible position. And basically what we do is we use computers, infrared cameras, beacons that we attach to bones to do this. And so this is a picture that shows the reaming of the acetabulum. And basically when we ream the acetabulum, we're sending data that goes to that beacon that you can see attached to the hip, and that transmits the position of our hip component. So as you can see on this, we are looking at a computer screen, and it tells us exactly what the proper position of the hip component is. And so when we insert your component, we can tell you exactly what the position of the socket was. And why is this important? We want to reduce the incidence of dislocations. And we want to make sure that your components last as long as they can. If we put your hip position in perfectly, we are very likely to avoid dislocations and to have great longevity of your components. We also can look at leg length, and patients can be very dissatisfied if they wind up with a lot longer leg or a lot shorter leg. And when we use computer navigation, I can tell you to the millimeter whether I've lengthened or shortened your leg. Now, in some cases, we actually want to lengthen a leg, and we plan this very carefully preoperatively. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the direct anterior approach of the hip. If you look at the approaches to the hip, there are basically three approaches surgically that we take to the hip. There's the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior. The posterior approach is by far and away the most common approach to doing hip replacement. It is an approach that works very well and has been used for many, many years and is still the most common approach that's used. But the anterior approach has gained increasing popularity recently because it's a bit more minimally invasive. We don't cut any muscles. We're able to use x-rays during our procedure. And there's a slight decrease in the post-operative restrictions. And interestingly enough, everybody has viewed this as a brand new approach, but it actually is described in 1927. Now, when we look at total hip replacements, and we look at why do things fail, you know, pretty much there are four reasons why people don't do well with hip replacement. You can get an infection, you can have instability or dislocation, you can have loosening, or you can have a leg length discrepancy. And so one of the reasons that we, many of us have turned to the anterior approach for some of our patients is we're trying to deal with the issues of instability and leg length discrepancy. So I want to talk a little bit about what exactly is the direct anterior approach. So this is a slide from an actual surgery that I've done where during the surgery you can see 
I'm taking x-rays of the reaming. So I know exactly where I'm reaming, similar to what I'm able to do with the navigation from my posterior approach. And when I insert the cup, I can see exactly where the cup and the stem are because I'm taking an x-ray of it at the time of surgery. And this allows us to not leave the operating room with any uncertainty. But there are patients that are just not candidates for the direct anterior approach because the direct anterior approach has two problems that we get concerned about. There's a higher risk of bone fracture and there's a little higher risk of loosening. So when we look at these three categories of patients, the obese patient on the upper left, the very muscular patient in the upper right, and the frail osteoporotic patient on the lower slide, these are patients that I think are a bit more risky when it comes to doing the direct anterior approach. And almost universally, these patients will be done with a posterior approach. And what should you expect from a total hip? You should have extremely high expectations in a total hip. You're gonna be in the hospital usually about one to two days. Initially, after your surgery, you're gonna feel great. The first day of surgery, you're gonna feel really great because of the medicine we inject into your hip. I always call that the honeymoon. Your pain relief is gonna be pretty quick. Most patients will tell me that they have very little hip pain after three to six weeks after surgery. The first six weeks, we spend time working on range of motion and walking, and you're gonna notice continuing improvement for 12 months. Specifically, you're gonna notice an improvement in the range of motion of your hip, the strength of the muscles of your hip, and your endurance when it comes to walking and doing activities such as hiking. But the patient satisfaction with this operation is very high. And in fact, in Canada, where all surgeries have to be justified, no surgery has a greater, higher patient satisfaction than total hip replacement in patients over the age of 60. So the last thing I wanna talk about is marquee. Because one of the reasons that I think you should really consider surgery in our facility is because we're one of the hospitals that participates in this very vigorous quality improvement initiative in the state of Michigan. Our goal in Marquis is to make Michigan the best place in the world to have a joint replacement. And almost every major institution that performs total hip and total knee replacement participate in this quality initiative. And what does that mean for you as a patient? Well, that means that every one of our cases is put into a database and it is compared to all the surgeries that are done throughout the state. And we are compared to our peers. We meet three times a year. And through those collaborations, we have universally in the state of Michigan reduced many quality problems. And this is not done anywhere else in the United States. And I wanna give you a couple of examples of how this has helped your friends and neighbors in the Lakeland era. So first of all, transfusions. Blood transfusions used to be fairly common when it came to hip replacement surgery. But as you can see on this graph, if we start in the upper left, this is how many transfusions we were giving about 10 years ago. And if you look in the lower right, you can see how many transfusions we give right now. Transfusions after total joint replacements are very rare. And why is this important? There's a higher risk of infection in patients that get transfusions. If you look at the broad infection rate, you can also see that the same trend line appears, that the trend line for infections throughout the state of Michigan has trended downward, and we have enjoyed that same decline at Lakeland. In fact, we have the lowest infection rate in the Michiana region and third, readmission rates. You can see the readmissions have dropped as well. And these positive improvements in quality have all come about because we have collaborated as orthopedic surgeons in the state of Michigan to make your surgery safer and to give you the best possible outcome that we can give you. So I hope I've 
been successful in answering your questions about what is hip arthritis? What are the conservative areas that we can treat for hip arthritis? What is hip replacement? And why at Lakeland do we do hip replacement with such success? What I'd like to do now is entertain any of the questions that you might have that perhaps I have not addressed in this presentation.